Hi everyone. Thanks very much for joining us for this session, um, looking at understanding modern pain science in clinical practice. We're very excited to have very um, two very well um, experienced therapists, Rosie and Patricia, um, join us. And we've had a great response to this um, talk. So I'm going to get started and I'm going to introduce Patricia. Patricia is a senior occupational therapist. Um, she's currently working at um, Better Access to Mental Health Practitioner. And Pat has a lot of experience. So I'm really pleased that um, Pat, you're able to present tonight and just share some of your experiences and how you manage pain. So without um, further ado, I'm gonna let you present Pat. Welcome. Thank you, good to see you. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Now, what I might do is actually, um, you can see my slides, but you can't see my face because of the living out here on the black soil. So that looks better, doesn't it? All right. So what I'm going to speak about is, um, well, first of all, I should say thank you very much for attending my presentation. And uh, let's get started because I always have lots to say about managing pain. So previously I worked in my own practice in Toowoomba and because I understand pain very well, and I'm sure you will have read some of my information about surviving the plane crash, you'll see that I'm always very passionate about changing pain for my clients. So what is pain? So pain is subjective experience that is influenced by physical, non-susceptive and neuropathic type pain. It's psychological and it also has environmental factors. Pain can be acute, subacute, recurrent or chronic. Chronic pain is pain that persists for three months or more or longer than the normal time required for healing. So pain is in fact very annoying, but it can be managed. So chronic pain is usually quite invisible. Um, it has social issues a lot. And after the plane crash, for example, I had terrible issues with connecting with my family because I always felt that they did not understand what I was going through. So here you can see that sufferers can feel misunderstood or stigmatized by their coworkers, friends, family, and even the med medical profession. So common challenges faced by people with chronic pain are usually things like, excuse me, <laughs> um, decreased employment, enjoyment of normal activities, a loss of function, role change, and relationship difficulties. Mental health is something that um, is impacted, of course, with from pain. One in five Australian adults with severe or very severe pain also suffer depression or other mood disorders. And one in three Australian adults with severe or very severe pain have high or very high levels of psychological stress. Uh, for me, my mental health was terrible. I used to treat myself very badly, which is why I ended up as a med mental health practitioner as well as someone who treated people's pain. So as an occupational therapist, we can do amazing things, that's for sure. Anyway, let's move on and let me introduce you to Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth was one of my clients who was born in 1941 and she was married to a gentleman. And he, she, when I first met her, the first thing she said to me was, oh, I've got crushed crumbling spine down the bottom and I've got cervical spine degeneration and I've got pain in both my shoulders and when I asked her about her pain she said oh well it's nearly always present but I do have some free time but her free time it lasted less than six hours which was mostly at night um, she was unable to go to work or do anything in the home it doesn't the pain didn't affect her sleep she slept well 
lies on her back, gets up to go to the toilet during the night, doesn't have any pain at night. She said that she did some mild daily exercise. And I said to her, well, do you see a physiotherapist? Oh, sometimes. And then she said, can you help me? And, um, and then, of course, we got started. So Interact Therapy, in my opinion, became one of the most marvellous products that I've ever used for managing my clients' pain levels. I've always managed my pain levels mostly with my brain. But clients who are in pain, they need to feel better first before they can start to work on how they think about pain. The Interex therapy certainly changed so many of my clients, and I'll always be grateful for learning how to use it. And I guess that's why I called it, you know, question mark, the complete pain practitioner. <laughs> so what is it? So what it does is it generates high voltage, high current, high density, and it's a modulated stimulation as well. It targets points of low impedance. And then there's all these different parameters that I've put there for you. But I'm very aware of the amount of time that I've got. So I'm not going to talk too much more about that. So what I've done is I've put up some information about Elizabeth and her lower back. For example, now this one, she said, oh, you know, her neck wasn't too bad. She can't stand up straight and getting more bent in the spine. Um, and then she'd had some new x-rays showing that her spine is bending more. And so what I did here was I just showed you um, some notes that I made that in this particular bit, there was what she called a bendy bit in her spine, and it was treated with the Interax um, on those levels there. Another one, here's another um, paperwork that I did, uh, probably not the best paperwork, but when you're working with somebody, just easier to just keep writing. Um, and then this was her neck. So again, lots of different um, levels, but I'm not going to say any more than that. So what's important with Elizabeth was after I did all the interact therapy on her neck and her back and everything else, this is the, what she came up with. So, and mostly it was fortnightly, but sometimes it was weekly. So this particular day, she said, oh, the last time I felt so good, I did some vacuuming, which um, blew me away because she hadn't used a vacuum for a very long time. And then another time she said that she was definitely feeling better in her hip. Um, she only had one cramp in the whole day. So that's how good Interact Therapy is. This one, she said she got out of bed today, feeling great, not much pain. Now it's only one out of 10. And this one, today her pain is one out of 10, almost all gone, I can't believe it. But then there were some days where things were a little bit different. So once she started um, exercising and doing more, um, her back seemed to flare up again. But once we did the interact, she felt better. One of the other things that I did with her was encourage her to do things to explore how her brain thinks. And so she was reading a mindfulness book, and I'm sure that Rosie's going to talk a little bit about all of that as well. Um, and so it certainly was helping her a lot. So she was very happy about that. So why does pain have a personality? And I call it a personality because pain is different for everyone. And I think I'll leave it again to Rosie to explain more about the importance of learning more about how pain impacts on us. But doing the mindfulness was so helpful for Elizabeth as she discovered. So pain also impacts upon our aspects of personal traits, exasperating them during pain episodes. At the level of pain function, uh, sorry, brain function, individuals who seek less stress, less risk and are more fearful to, of pain are more likely to experience more pain. 
Now, I hope that makes sense. Um, one of the things that I do for myself is manage my pain with my brain. And so it's very important for me to talk myself out of it because what we do is how we think or talk or feel about pain impacts upon our pain levels. And I know that Rosie's going to explain more about that as well. So the story of pain, pain experiences are normal. And this, I, I met um, Mr. Mosley and his partner in Brisbane, oh, many years ago when they first started. And when he talked about all of this now, of course, you can get onto the internet and, and, and see all sorts of things and see his presentations. But he, they were just amazing. And they talked about this. Pain experiences are normal. They are an excellent, if unpleasant, response to what your brain judges to be threatening, to be a threatening situation. Even if problems do exist in your body, it won't hurt if your brain thinks you are not in danger. And when I heard them say that, I was like, yes, I got it right. So that was just amazing. So as I said, pain is different for everyone. Um, and how we think and feel and about our pain impacts upon our pain levels. So I do all sorts of interesting things. For example, you know, when I look at this part, um, a lot of my clients would say things like, oh, I've got a bad back or I've slipped a disc or I've got a good leg, a bad leg, or I've got a screwdriver in my back. But I'd say to them, well, hang on, you know, you don't have to say those sort of things. You could say things like, it only takes one step to climb a mountain. You can do it. Oh my God, I made it. Or you could say, Pat, you are individual, special and unique. Yes. And it helps to manage how your pain is. I believe that it's very important to listen to your clients. Let them say whatever, get it out. And so share their stories. And then you can show them some alternatives, for example, things like changing your negative word use or learning about what the human body is. It was an occupational therapist who completely changed my life, which is why I became one. And so we can change every person that we work with. It's an amazing job. So I particularly like this setting of goals relating to meaningfulness, doing, being, becoming, and belonging. That's what we can do. And so then we don't have to be fearful or depressed or anxious or frustrated. So we can change every person with whom we work. It's an amazing job. Thanks for listening to me and I'm going to hand over to Bev right now. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Does anyone have any questions for Pat? I thought I'd just explain that when Pat put up some of the slides, there were numbers on um, the sheets of paper. The numbers on the sheets of paper is really numbers that come up on the Interax device. So when you have uh, the Interax device, um, when you turn it on, you'll see um, numbers up in one corner and then the numbers that we're looking for. So typically what we're looking for is areas of low impedance. And then when we've got um, areas of low impedance, this number on screen, I don't know whether, if I can do it on me. If you see that number that comes up, they're the numbers that we're looking for. Um, and so we're looking for areas of low impedance, which reflects higher numbers on the device. And if you want to know more about that, um, I can certainly um, follow up and, and give you some more information on that. So we'll move to the next part of our um, presentation tonight, if there's no questions. And um, we've got Rosie, Rosie Gospel. 
And I've known Rosie for a while and she's a great hand therapist. Um, so I'm really excited to hear you talk about the study of pain, um, modern pain science and how this affects understanding this and how this then allows us to be able to treat our patients better in the management of pain. So thanks, Rosie. Thank you, Bev, and thank you for having me. Welcome, everybody. So uh, as Bev mentioned, my name's Rosie. I'm an OT um, and an occupational therapist, and I treat complex regional pain syndrome through telehealth at the moment. I have been a hand therapist for 14 years, though, so I'll be using examples from that caseload today. I'm going to share my screen. Now, Sherelle has kindly offered to email you all these slides tomorrow morning if you would like them. Uh, so there's no need to take notes. So you're welcome just to sit back and relax. And if there's any questions that we don't get through tonight, you're welcome to email me. Um, hopefully you can see it underneath my video there, info at compassionatehands.com.au. So before we start, my invitation to you is to get into best learner mode. So if you're feeling really tired, it's that time of evening, perhaps doing some body slaps, waking up, if you're standing up, you could jump up and down. Or if you've had a, a stressful, busy day and you need to down-regulate, then get comfy so you're probably sitting down feel your feet on the floor and take a couple of slow breaths all right let's jump in so my learning objectives for tonight are to inspire curiosity to learn more about modern pain science I'll be sharing tools and resources I use for patient education, and I'll be interspersing the most recent directions for pain education. So this is the International Association of Pain's revised definition, an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And they expand this with six key notes and I've left them all in my presentation for you to, to read uh, later if you want to, but I'm skipping to number two because I'm hoping I'll have time to share a great two minute video at the end with you. But this one's really important. Pain and nociception are different phenomenon. Pain cannot be inferred solely from activity in a sensory neuron. So this is a common misconception that is still being propagated by pain scientists and pain specialists even. So to paraphrase Ronald Melzack, who was um, a, a big man in the pain science world, he said that saying that pain and nociception are interchangeable is a very unfortunate simplification. Number three, through their life experiences, individuals learn the concept of pain. So I think that modern pain science is very counterintuitive. It's not what you would think or imagine as being common sense. So for example, pain doesn't give us an accurate representation about what's happening in our bodies at this, at the moment we're feeling it. Pain's purpose is to try and protect us, the organism from future damage. So pain education is difficult because it's not just about learning new things. It's about dismantling misconceptions that might have been there for a lifetime. So this iceberg image is useful for conceptualizing pain education. So below the waterline, is the information that health professionals need to know about modern pain science in order to deliver effective pain education with our patients. 
And above the waterline is knowledge about pain that we would ideally like our patients to gain. Now, these four essential pain facts have been put together by this group down here. It took them 11 years, 350 recovered consumers, 36 scientists and clinicians from six scientific disciplines and seven clinical disciplines, uh, plus 220 from the general public. So they put a lot of effort into condensing down what, what they consider our patients sh should understand about pain. So number one, pain protects us and promotes healing. Two, persistent pain overprotects us and prevents recovery. Three, many factors influence pain. Four, there are many ways to reduce pain and promote recovery. So although these don't sound all that hard, in order to create changes in what our patients believe at a deep level about their own particular pain state, it really is a much, much harder task. So the more health professionals that are putting effort in this direction, the better. Now, there was another essential pain fact which narrowly missed the top four, and it was that pain is always real. Um, it's not in someone's head. Now, this essential pain fact wasn't included because apparently our patients already know this. They know their pain is real. They just aren't certain that their health professionals know their pain is real. So pain education done badly sometimes comes across as it's all in your head. Now, pain education is moving away from being so brain centric. So pain, you might have heard of explain pain from Noy in the past and on their own reflection, they're saying they've been focusing too much on the brain and the message of it's all in your head um, might have been too easily um, mistakenly given. So when our patients don't feel heard and don't feel validated, it has a massive impact on them. So it's really important that we show compassion for their suffering, but it's also important that we're very mindful of the way we do that. We can make things a lot worse without meaning to, and I'll go into that more in a minute. But first of all, in order to really get pain, you need to understand that pain is not linear, it's emergent. So I recently had a lady with complex regional pain syndrome say that she doesn't understand how her wrist fracture, which turned into a radial nerve injury, that healed perfectly, could lead to the domino effect that it did. And I thought her language of domino effect was really interesting. I think it's telling me that she's trying and failing to understand her CRPS or her persistent pain state in this linear way. So most people do try and conceptualize pain in a linear way. And I think this is natural because our brains like to make sense of the world in this way. Now, in order to understand what linear and emergent phenomenon is, and you can do this with your patients, some patients they can definitely be taught this, it's good to compare and contrast. So linear is sequential. First this, then this, then this. Compared to emergent, it's the interaction of the entire collection of agents together cause the observable pattern. And when you're teaching, ideally you should use two examples with your patients. So the examples below are from nature. On the left, this linear cycles of the moon. First this phase, before this phase, before this phase. Compared to something like a termite mound, where so many thousands of different factors are all interacting at the same time for that amazing phenomenon to emerge. So some of the factors would be to do with the soil, the weather, the termites, and there can never be a singular cause or blame for the construction of a termite mound. And so it is with pain. So I was thinking that if pain was a game, which it isn't, but 
Um, if Plane was a game, it wouldn't be dominoes. It would be more like pick-up sticks. So hopefully you've all played, played this as a kid. So the pick-up sticks, lots of different factors all interacting at the same time. And I was thinking that treating pain is also similar to playing pick-up sticks. Often you need to remove lots of different sticks and come at the problem from lots of different angles. Now pick-up sticks also illustrates allopathic load quite well. Allopathic load is where there is stress or lo increased load on lots of different systems in the body at the same time. So another way of saying it is total physiological load new, has a new set point, a new higher set point. And allopathic load is being investigated by pain scientists as a contributor to pain chronicity. So I had bladder pain for 13 years and it was due to increased allopathic load. And I had to reduce that reducing Sorry, I had to work at reducing stress in lots of different body systems at the same time. So autonomic nervous system, digestive system, immune system. And with lots of help and effort, I was able to bring that condition into full remission. So apparently there's no cure for this bladder pain, but I've been pain free for six years now. And it's no surprise to me that they haven't found that one thing to fix the problem because you have to come at it like pickup sticks. Um, and so it is with lots of um, persistent pain states. And we're gonna use compare and contrast again. So let's compare the old view of pain on the left with the modern view of pain on the right. So on the left, the old view, it's very linear as you can see, and simple. And it's also confusing nociception with pain. So we don't have pain receptors in our tissues, we just have receptors. You could also call them sensors or our patients apparently prefer the terminology detectors, it's more evocative for them. So we don't have pain receptors, but in this old model, you would stub your toe and pain would zip along a nerve and it would get to the brain and you'd have pain. So we also don't have pain messages going along nerves. And when messages get to the brain, you may or may not have pain as an outcome. The modern view of pain over here, as you can see, is really embracing complexity. It's also illustrating how pain is emergent, all of these different things going on at the same time for pain to emerge. So starting at the bottom, we have specialized sensors or danger detectors, good terminology for patients, but there's also load detectors, torque detectors, length detectors, which provide more information about what might be going on with a body part. Now, it might be hard to read all of this complexity. So I've enlarged just that section for you. And on the far right, we have the gut. So we now have a huge amount of scientific data about the microbiome in the gut and its relationship to unhealthy systemic inflammation and pain chronicity. Over here, we've got these dials with inflammation and hormones. So this reminds me of this allostatic load that I was talking about before that makes pain chronicity more likely. And then up in the top left, we've got a filing cabinet with previous experiences and outcomes. So any big T traumas like war or assaults or little T traumas like chronic stress at work or within a relationship, particularly if they're not properly processed by the organism, get straw, stored and drawn upon and can have a massive impact on pain chronicity. Now, this one is a big one, beliefs. Particularly beliefs about a body part not being fit for purpose. So this terminology, fit for purpose, um, is coming out in a new model from Laura Mosley, I think next year. 
and uh, so keep an eye out for this. And this belief of being not fit for purpose or a body part not being fit for purpose was a huge part of 20 years of chronic back pain for me. And so I, I really understand how important it is to, to examine your beliefs. And of course, hard to change them, but is, it is possible. We also know that positive beliefs can have a placebo effect and are incredibly powerful. There's so much evidence about that now. Underneath my video, it says context. So the environments we're in, the relationships we have with people are often hugely relevant to a pain experience. Now, Pat mentioned language already. The language we speak about our own bodies, such as the doctor said it's the worst fracture he's ever seen. You know, if that person is repeating that to all their friends and family, the subconscious is listening to that. Worst fracture, worst fracture, whoa, protect, protect. Pain is far more likely. But also the language used by other people, particularly if it's from people that you have a high opinion of, uh, can be a powerful driver of a persistent pain state. So it can literally be any information from us, from within us, the organism, or from our external environment, which can be relevant in a persistent pain state. The level of complexity is absolutely awesome. Now, remember those four essential pain facts that we are hoping our patients will learn. Um, the one about protection can be explained with the Twin Peaks model. So lots of you might have seen this already, um, but if you haven't, it's a very easy way to explain uh, pain to your patients. So this is the mountain before injury, and this is the mountain after injury. So imagine you were climbing the mountain and at a certain point, your legs would start to hurt. This is the protect by pain line. And if you kept pushing through, you would reach the tissue tolerance line. So you might start tearing muscles, tendons, ligaments. So you can see how normally we have this built-in safety buffer zone where we have pain to tell us or, you know, time to slow down, reduce the load on, on your body. After injury, can you see that there's a new tissue tolerance line? It's further down the mountain. And it depends on what the injury was, how long it's been, the allopathic load of the individual, the age, lots of different factors, of course, as to how strong that tissue is at any, any point. But let's imagine it was a tendon injury and it's three months post and you're telling them that it's strong enough to do normal activities, but you wouldn't want them mountain climbing and just hanging off with their full body weight off that hand. So it's, it is down the mountain a bit. But the, there's a new protect by pain line. And can you see how it's way, way, way down here? So after injury, we're designed to increase this safety buffer zone so that we don't overload our tissues before they're ready. Now, for some people, their baseline might be here. They might be at three months and they're still in pain. And they might be thinking that if they do these exercises or start to do activities, that they're doing damage to their tissues because it's hurting. And they, they need to be told that they're here, they're not up here, that they've got this big safety buffer zone. And by moving and um, using their, their body part, they're more likely to push this tissue line up here to make the tissue strong again. Of course, we don't want them going over the flare up line too often. They'll accidentally do it and we'll, we give them strategies about how to settle it afterwards, tell them not to freak out over a flare up. But ideally, they've got this zone where they need to be um, finding the ideal amount of exercise and activity.
Now, back to language again. So remember language was one of the many factors on that complexity slide and Pat mentioned it as well. So what we as health professionals say and also our nonverbal communication is being carefully observed by our patients um, and remembered. So if we use dangerous language and overly alarm a patient for no good reason, it could be enough to get the ball rolling for pain chronicity or make existing persistent pain worse. So remember pain is about protection. So if, if you give the patient the idea that there is something dangerous going on with a body part, it might turn up the volume on a hypersensitive pain system. So I'll give you a minute to read this slide on your own. So I mentioned earlier that it's important to validate our patient's experience of pain and demonstrate compassion for their suffering. But how we do that is so important. And through our communication alone, we could make their pain state worse. So I had 20 years of persistent lower back pain after an injury and I requested a repeat X-ray. Um, my plan was to go to a spinal surgeon for an opinion. And the radiologist came out to me and said, are you sure you don't have pins and needles or numbness in your legs? And he had this concerned expression. And I think he was just trying to be nice and demonstrate compassion. And he said, oh yeah, that x-ray looks pretty bad. And no wonder you want a surgical opinion. But can you imagine what that kind of uh, messaging could do to uh, an already hypersensitive pain state? So, not a great idea, but health professionals do it all the time, unfortunately. So I had this 20 years of persistent lower back pain after injuring my back, lifting a bucket of heavy apricots at the end of a long day. So I was 17 and I tried lots of different therapies and I got temporary relief um, from lots of them, but it would come back pretty quickly. So I had pain the majority of the time and it really restricted me from doing lots of activities that I would normally like to do. I was very careful with the way I moved and slept. Um, I was just fearful of making my back pain worse or my, my back worse. I actually had some thoughts that it was going to slip further, the vertebra, and that I might end up in a wheelchair or lose bladder or bowel control. And these beliefs and the things that I would say about my back were turned out to be one of the biggest driving forces behind my persistent pain state. So I believed that my back was fragile, that it wasn't fit for purpose. So I thought probably a spinal fusion was going to end my pain. And for some reason, I tried one more physio uh, he had treated some Olympic sports team or something. And so I went along, I had two sessions. He gave me some complicated exercises, which I didn't do. And he did some pain education, personalized pain education with me. So we just talked, he had my x-ray up on the screen and he pointed things out and he said, he's got a similar condition and he doesn't have pain and he plays sports. And at this point, I'd already done quite a lot of professional development about pain. So I knew in theory that I could have a hypersensitive pain system. But deep down, I thought it was a structural issue. And in order to fix the pain, I needed surgery. So he managed to convince me that my, my back was stable. It wasn't going to slip any further that the best thing to do would be to relax and move more naturally and start doing more bit by bit, which I did. And that pain went away. After 20 years, uh, that pain went away over the next few weeks and months. 
and I hardly ever get pain anymore. Um, and that's been for about seven years. So I'll give you a second just to read this quote from Lorimer Mosley again. So because of my experience with my back pain, I now have a, a strong embodied sense of how powerful individualized pain education can be. Now, I'm getting towards the end of my slides now. So perhaps time for another quick shake as I'm transitioning from talking about pain education to some other treatments. So pain education can certainly be an amazing treatment, but it shouldn't be done alone. So I've been using Interex for about two years and Flex Beams for, I think, a bit more than a year with nearly all of my hand therapy caseload. And I love the way these methods of treatment bring down an allopathic load. So I believe that if I'd had this technology and knowledge years ago, I wouldn't have had that bladder pain for 13 years. I recently heard Mark Hutchinson talk about um, pain at the master sessions. So Mark is a professor at Adelaide Medical School and president of Science and Technology Australia. He is also an amazing researcher who's on the cutting edge of neuroimmune pain biology. He said that complex problems need complex solutions. And he talked for several hours, but these are four of my favorite take homes from him. One, personalized. He said that pain treatments need to be personalized. He also said he believes it's unlikely there will be a single molecular combination which fixes every kind of persistent pain state. Two, parallel. This means using multiple treatment modalities and tools at the same time where possible. So for example, when treating my hand therapy caseload, if they were lying down for an interex and flex beam treatment, might be abdominal zone or the neuropathic pain points protocol, I would ask the patient if they wanted to hear a story about pain and introduce pain education that way. Or if they were sitting up and getting vagal nerve or trigeminal nerve or scalp or neck, um, I'd have my iPad Pro in front of them and they could be looking at a video or some other kind of multimedia education and we could discuss at the same time. Three, multidimensional. So not just focusing on the biology of a person, but other dimensions such as psychological, social, environmental, which admittedly can all change us at a molecular level. And four, biofeedback enhanced. So he used the example of biofeedback enhanced meditation for pain, but I was thinking Interax is another good example of being able to give biofeedback. So not only does it take readings of the body at various points, but my favorite is when doing vagal nerve stimulation, you can ask the patient to observe how it feels when their autonomic nervous system is down-regulating. And I think that's so powerful for patients learning. So take home messages from my talk today. Pain is emergent, not linear. So it's more like pickup sticks than dominoes. Pain is complex, but this complexity gives us many treatment avenues to pursue. Pain is about protection. So picture the Twin Peaks model with the safety buffer zone that gets even bigger after injury. So pain is not an accurate measure about what is going on with the tissues of the body. Language is important. So we can modify our language to hopefully be interpreted as less threatening. And five, individualized parallel treatments are the future for treating persistent pain states. So 
so these are resources that I use with my patients. Explain Pain Second Edition has been around a few years now, but is still great. It's got a, a medium level of jargon, so um, keep that in mind with your patients. The Explain Pain Handbook of Protectometer has got a low level of jargon, and so it's very easy to use with anyone. I really like Steve Haynes' book, Pain is Really Strange. It's a cartoon book, uh, but it is based on modern pain science. Pain and Perception is new. It's by Daniel Harvey and Laura Mosley, and it uses illusion um, to tell us about pain. So the pain world is really looking at how predictive processing uh, informs us about pain and so this book is a way in with that. Painful Yarns has got pain stories to illustrate different pain point, uh, different points about pain. These are some great videos that you can show patients. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to show that one. So this is also a website, but that video is a particularly good summary about why pain persists. So this video um, has been out quite a while, still on YouTube, super funny, patients love it. I think it goes for about 17 minutes. Thank you, next slide. Let's imagine the relationship between pain and tissue damage as like a cliff. You only injure your tissues when you go over the cliff. And in normal circumstances, pain is like a protective barrier that stops you getting too close. You can still enjoy the view, but pain keeps you safe. Now imagine this protective system becomes overprotective, pushing you further from the edge. Now you can no longer see or enjoy the view. This is what happens with persistent pain. Our pain systems can become overprotective. It hurts, but not because you're over the edge. It's because your system is protecting you too well. But the good news, just as your pain system can learn to be overprotective, it can learn to be less protective, back to a more reasonable level of protection. Through understanding how pain works, we can re-engage in movement and activities and life. We can be unshackled from pain and enjoy the view once again. So if you haven't already, I recommend an Explain Pain course online or in person. And if you have done Explain Pain already, Explain Pain Applications is a bit longer course that takes it to a, a new depth, which is fantastic. I noticed in November there's an Explain Pain specifically for stroke and neurological rehabilitation, which I thought might interest uh, lots of you attending tonight. The Neuroorthopaedic Institute has got 63 research articles listed on the website here, all investigating pain education. And these are great resources for clinicians. So I hope you find the tools and resources I use for patient education useful.
Pain science is a rapidly growing field, but we have organisations such as NOI and Pain Revolution, helping us as clinicians to keep up to date with the latest discoveries and providing us with tools to help our patients with persistent pain. But most of all, going back to my objectives at the beginning, I hope my talk today has inspired your curiosity to learn more about modern pain science and to share it with your patients. Thank you. I'll pass it on to Bev. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks for uh, a great presentation.